we're going to transition to the bottom half of this page to see if we can um, consolidate and really wrap our heads around the big ticket new ideas, and there were a lot of them, that we introduced on Friday morning. This is a big topic, right? I get really excited. Sorry, let me start that sentence again. I got really excited a couple of years ago when the Extension 2 course, which has not been changed for like 35 years, when we first saw the draft of it, and this topic, the nature of proof, the one that we met last Friday, when it was included, because it is so different to every other kind of mathematics you've been doing, and yet eerily familiar. So what we're going to do is, some of the concepts I introduced on Friday that we had a look at, we're going to kind of dig deeper into them, we're going to formalize some of them, and then see where they go. And then you'll get to play your hand at doing some more proofs of your own that are not just Ken Ken related ones. All right, so pick up your pen if you've got it there, and uh, let's begin with, well, do you remember what is the building block of every proof? What is the basic unit we use? It's a statement. statement. Thank you very much. So these things really are the, uh, the alphabet that we are writing this language of proof with, right? Now I told you there are, um, there's at least one other name that you already know about that we sometimes say instead of a statement, we might say that's a, starts with a C, that's a claim, right? It's like I claim something to be true. Um, that's one other alternative name, but there was other, one other more fancy name, one more technical name that I didn't tell you, just I didn't want to bombard you too much with language, even though I did a little bit. Um, the super fancy name for this, if you want to make yourself sound more intelligent, you say, oh, that's an interesting proposition, right? Um, and what's nice about both of these is that you can see the verb that's underneath it for each one. I state that something is true, or I claim or I propose that something is true, right? So each noun comes with its verb. So just as some examples here, right? And it's not just because it's the last period of the day and this is what I'm thinking of, but potentially you might have these statements, P and Q, in your head. It's 3 p.m. That's a statement, right? I claim it is 3 p.m. right now. I'd be wrong at this exact moment, but I can still claim it, right? Um, the bell will ring. That's another statement. Okay, and you're going to see we, we're going to put these together in lots of different ways. All right, so statements, they sit on their own, but when you start to put them together, right, when you say one statement leads to another, what do we call that? Starts with an I. Implication. Thank you very much, Calvin. Implication, right? So again, uh, each of these nouns has a verb with it. So when you see this P and this double arrow. By the way, you can also use, or you might see in textbooks, just a single arrow. I like to write the double arrow because it's kind of like, this is quite special to logic and proof. You don't really see it anywhere else. The way I would read that as I'm looking at a proof is, P implies, I'm using the wrong color, <laughs> implies Q. Okay. Now, just like with this box with the statement, right, we're going to dig into this a little more and explore some of the more different ways of saying the different language you can use here, right? So if P implies Q, and if you have a look up above, right, I am suggesting that P, it's 3 p.m., implies Q, the bell will ring, uh, we can say this in terms of, well, P, it's, it's enough, right? It's adequate. It will cause Q. But we have a fancy word for enough or adequate, starts with an S, we would say it's sufficient to cause Q. Thank you very much. Now, if you look at it from the other point of view, right? If you look at it from the, the conclusion, from the results point of view, right? Q has to result. If P happens and it leads to Q, then Q is a... What's a word that starts with N that like, it has to happen? It's, you've got no choice about it. It's necessary, right? Q is necessary given P. So we would say P is a sufficient condition for Q, Q is a necessary condition for P. Now, uh, we can also state this in terms of kind of like if you're reasoning through this, right? P happens, it leads to Q. So if you know that the first thing happens, it's a necessary condition to a sufficient condition, as you say, to re result in this last one. A nice succinct way to summarize that is if one happens, then the other will follow. If P, then Q. And when you see it written in this particular way, implications get another fancy name because this thing you can see in quotes there, right? If P, then Q. That is itself a statement, isn't it? That, that can be either true or false, right? That's, that's anything that can be true or false, but not both. 
that's a statement. So the kind of statement that we call it is based on the fact that, well, it, it may be true sometimes. In other words, if it meets this certain condition. So we call it a conditional statement. Hey, you going so far? Brain okay? So far we're using words that are still pretty familiar, right? All right, let's keep going. Do you remember what was the big next word that we introduced? Uh, that's when you're talking about trying to flip around logic or looking at it from a different direction. And for negation. negation, thank you. Negation as in negative, right? So just like in, um, in integer land, right? Negation or negative, it means the opposite, opposite of something, right? Yes, Chad, do you have a question? Oh, uh, yes. The other day I just checked some other, well, other textbooks, really. And then they use a symbol with like waves uh -huh. or negation. Yes, I'm so glad that you asked that question. In fact, it's almost as though I have a place on my piece of paper that is anticipating that exact idea. Um, I mentioned there's a symbol for negation, right? It's this little step here. It is my preferred symbol, but it's not the only symbol you'll see. You'll also see exactly what Jao's talking about. Um, this little wavy line, it's called a tilde, by the way, um, that's at the front. It's the prefix of whatever statement you've got. Um, they both mean the same thing. I didn't introduce this the first time because some of you may have seen this wiggly sign. It also means something else. Has anyone, has anyone else seen what it might mean in a different context? Uh, sometimes you see it over the top of something like this, uh, and that means a vector, right? Um, even earlier than that, like in year seven, you would have met this symbol. It's like, ah, uh, it's approximately equal. Like, I'm estimating or I'm rounding, right? Double line? Well, sometimes you see two, sometimes you see one, right? So this is what I mean. Now, I'm putting this here so that if you ever see this in the context of logic and proof, you know it means negation. But when I'm writing, just because I want to be as clear and unambiguous as possible, I'll always use, um, I always prefer this kind of step symbol here, right? So we read both of them as the negation of P or more simply, not P, okay? Now, um, as I said up above, I've given you an example of what P could be. It's 3 p.m. Uh, we could just put the word not in front of it, but that doesn't make real good English, right? So when you have negations or any other kind of statement for that matter, interpret the grammar with your brain, okay? So in this case, if P is it's 3 p.m., what would you say is the negation of P? How would you say that in English? It is not 3 p.m. That'll do me. It's not 3 p.m. PM. Those of you who are um, bilingual or multilingual will know, in fact, that sometimes other languages will actually just say, no, we'll just put a no at the front. Not, it's 3 p.m. That's how we say it. But in English, this is what we would say. Now, uh, what we're going to do now here is put all the building blocks together, right? We're getting more pieces in our Lego kit. So you've got negations and implications. Unsurprisingly, you can negate an implication, because an implication is itself, as we saw above, it's, a, it's kind of a super statement of like a couple of statements put together, right? So if it is a statement itself, you can negate it, right? So here is me using the notation we've introduced so far. Do you see this? Not P implies Q. Now, how can we try and like unpack what this actually means? I want you to think about this, right? Um, in fact, I'm gonna get you to turn to the person next to you in a second to see if you can turn this into English and the appropriate symbols. This is P, this is Q. So P implies Q, you would say in English as if it's 3 p.m., then the bell will ring, right? That's P implies Q. So what would be the negation of that? Think for a second and then turn to the person next to you. I'm going to give you, I'm actually going to wander around a little bit. How would you say this in English, the negation of P then Q? And how would you write it? in symbols. Take a moment, I'm going to wander around a little bit. I'll admit, this is a slightly cruel question to pose to you, because if we in this room were just deciding the rules of logic for ourselves, right? You know, a lot of maths is discovered, right? It's like, it's just out there in the universe, like pi, it's just, circles are like that, man. You measure across, you measure around, that's always the ratio. We just happened upon that. But a lot of mathematics is not discovered it's invented, we just made it up. We just decided it was gonna be this way, right? It's like, you know what? Just gonna start from the positive real axis and go anti-clockwise, right? Let's just go that way, right? 
With this, we could actually define this in a bunch of ways, but I'm going to try and make an argument as to why some are better than others. Okay? Now, I found it really interesting, and I'm sh I know because I heard some of them. Um, some of you looked at this and you're like, ooh, brackets. I know what to do with brackets. If, I, if you saw, for example, 2 outside of x plus y, you'd be like, 2x plus 2y, you know, wipe your hands, feel happy, right? Now let's just think about what that might mean for this statement, okay? Let's just, let's just write it, okay? If I just distributed the negation into the brackets, right? It would look, I'm guessing, something like this. Do you agree with that? That's just me putting not in front of all the statements, okay? Now let's try and turn that into English and see if it is a meaningful Negation, because remember, you all wrote up above. A negation means opposite, yeah? Okay, not P implies not Q. That means if it's not 3 p.m., then the bell will not ring. Is that the opposite of P implies Q? I, I actually think... What are you thinking, Calvin? I'm interested. There's like a, a conversation. I want to know what's going on. Like, what are you thinking? Oh, he thinks it's, if it's not P, then not Q, and I think it's some. Um, if it's not P, then it's Q or somebody. If it's P, not Q, I don't know what he's thinking, but just argue with that. I, I, smart move. It's like, before I suggest, you know, throwing my idea, I'm going to throw my friend under the bus first. You know, it's like, hey, this is what he thinks. And it's, it's true. This is the point where there's some ambiguity here, right? Let me suggest to you, if I said to you, it's 3 p.m., that means the bell will ring. I think if we had not introduced any of this fancy symbol, symbols and notation, most of you would have said the opposite of that is, if it's 3 p.m., the bell won't ring. That's the opposite implication. Does that make sense? If it's 3 p.m., there's the condition, right? Then the bell will either ring or it won't. That is the most natural English way to read the negation. How do we turn that into symbols. Hmm. Well, actually, I stated P as it was, right? It's 3 p.m. But what I'm suggesting is it leads to the opposite thing. This is the negation of my implication, which I know is a bit weird, right? Let's write it together in English. If it's 3 p.m., the bell won't ring, or then the bell won't ring. In, uh, in formal logical language, this is actually what we expect. Now, there is one other way where you could potentially write it, but you've got to be a bit careful. Um, you know when you have an equal sign, if you want to say not equals, you have the equal sign, and then what do you do to it? You strike it out, right? So you actually can, and I'm going to use it later on on this page, I think, you can actually have the implication and then strike it out, right? But um, it is clearer and less ambiguous to write it in this purple way that I've got over here, okay? Now, why is this important? This is super important. And this is why I'm going to argue that rather than having the not on the P or the not on both the P and the Q, this is better, right? This is a really useful way to logically disprove something. Does that make sense? Someone comes to you and says, I reckon if it's 3 p.m., then the bell will ring. You're like, I don't know. Can I prove that that person is wrong? So what you do is you wait until it's 3 p.m. And then if the bell doesn't ring, you have disproved them. Does that make sense? Yep. And it's easy to do. You just wait for a Saturday or a Sunday. It's 3 p.m., bell won't ring. Make sense? So let's just jot that down. This is why this logical piece is so important. It's how you disprove a statement. Uh, you've been used to proving statements, right? But it is just as important you might remember this with our um, riddle of truth tellers and liars, right? It is just as important to be able to disprove something. 